Frank Matsert, uh, CEO of Trademark East Africa, thank you so much uh, for today's main speak. What were your impressions? Well, I, I think I really enjoyed it a lot, and I really thank you for, for inviting me, Ali. Pleasure. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think the, br the range of questions was um, bigger than I thought. Yes. And actually, the quality of the questions um, was, was really good. Mm. Um, some quite challenging questions there. Uh, and also, technically, some quite tricky questions by Twitter yes. uh, <laughs> from, from a good friend across the region. Yes. But uh, I think uh, it's been a great experience, very interesting, and uh, I really, really enjoyed it a lot. I, I think it was also interesting to engage with a, an audience that I'm not used to engaging yes. with, which is kind of really young, up and coming entrepreneurs. And, and, and I think that's, it's really interesting, the kind of the quality and also the range of questions they asked, mm. which of course I think are probably related to the way that they, they're looking at, at the, the subject matter. And what I found interesting was when you asked for a show of hands about optimists and pessimists, there yes. was just one pessimist in the entire Indeed, audience. I, I think that's right. And it's it probably a reflection of the age group, I guess, a bit. But uh, I think there is a lot of optimism ab about you know, uh, the region's potential. Mm. Frank, you, 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 you touched on so many interesting subjects. And uh, if I might just, just go back to start off with trademark itself. Oh, yes, OK. How many years? I remember 2010, I think, you were made the CEO. Was that when trademark was actually set up? Well, what happened was quite a long journey for me because I used to work for Diffid before. And we, we, I started work here back in 2006 and essentially did some initial work thinking about why, why these countries wanted to come together. And we, 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 we produced that in 2007 and then started working in the EAC. And we really defined the trademark idea mm. back in 2008 mm. and then began to market it in 2009, mm. set it up legally that year, and then away it went. So there's, there was a lot of preparation yes. work that went up t into it. Um, so, you know, it's had a relatively long gestation period. And also you want something like a trademark uh, approach to be very based on practice. And we did a lot of... Um, at that time, we looked at what hasn't worked, mm. what could work, and talked to uh, literally hundreds of people mm. in the design of it. So, I, you know, for me, it's really fantastic to have seen that vision really from nothing to where it is now. Yes. It's been very satisfying. And it's now a central player in the region. Uh, uh, well, I, I think it's certainly, you know, we, what we try to do is we try to get behind partners. Mm. So we see our role as being a facilitator. You know, the, the kind of whole regional integration agenda yes. is really driven by the heads of state, by SG Sessabera. Our, our job at Trademark is to give a bit of petrol, yes. a bit of oil, if it was a truck, if you think about it like that analogy, and maybe a map, you know, when, when, when they get into to, you know, tricky territory. Um, but it's not to drive it. And I think we've really tried our best to get behind partners. And, you know, that's, that's been a quite an important that, ethos. That's quite a sensitive thing to play at it as is. well, isn't it? Yeah. Because you don't want to put people off and who that's it and I think initially there was a bit of bit of suspicion as what is this trademark thing because yes. no, no one had ever tried something like that before which is you know a special purpose vehicle particularly focusing on one challenge of trade costs mm -hmm. so you know it took a bit of time but I think you know I'm really pleased because yes. we actually hear now heads of state saying we really like this trademark mm -hmm. thing it's more responsive it's doing the job uh, so that gives me a lot of satisfaction but it's also important to to see the results coming through and I, and I think I said earlier that um, for us, you know, at an aggregate level, we're really on, ta on target mm. to, to do much better than we projected. And I'm really pleased about that. And where, where, what have been your greatest successes? Well, I, I think, you know, a lot of people ask me today about Burundi. Yes. And I think, you know, particularly... They, they were all taken by that. Yeah, yes. no, it's quite an interesting story, Burundi. And Burundi has been a country that struggled coming out of the civil war, you know, and has now really got on its feet. But the institutions of the state were quite, un, you know, they were quite undermined. So really what we tried to do was to get behind building a revenue authority, which every other country in East Africa has. In fact, Rwanda's you know, huge progress since the genocide was based on the Rwanda Revenue Authority. Yes. If you ask Kagame what the biggest reform for him was, it was that. The ability to, make, to yes, collect. Yes, because that creates a level of independence and the state begins to function. So really, I think we're really proud because we got behind that process legally first with the laws. And then secondly, with the institution building phase, and now with the upgrading, you know, the institutions come a long, long way. In fact, it's, it's been a faster reform than in Rwanda, which you know, many people wow. don't know. We had a great commissioner general who was an expatriate. Actually, every, pretty much every revenue authority had an expatriate at the beginning. Burundi adopted that model. Now there's really good Burundian leadership. And I mean, I think the story tells itself. You know, we, we've seen a doubling, more than doubling now, I think about 150% increase in revenues 
And that's getting on now, I think, for $400 million. We invested so far 20. Well, yes. That's a pretty good level of return. That's a huge return. Yeah. So we followed the money. And uh, I think I said here today, that's allowed from Burundian tax uh, generation, 40,000 people a month to get access to health. That didn't before. So, you know, that's to health services. And I think that's a really big transformation, actually. That, that sort of ability to get behind and, and let those partners really run, run with that kind of development. So we're proud of that kind of reform. But I think a lot of the, the work that we've been doing on simplifying trade and some of the electronic systems have been yes. quite transformational. But um, for example, the electronic cargo tracking in, in Uganda, the Rwanda single window, we're hoping to, to do a good replacement to Simba here in Kenya, yes. which we hope will make a big difference. Looking at, uh, you know, at the community, you know, take Mombasa. Mombasa still seems to be the main entry point yeah. and exit point for our goods. Is, is that going to remain the case? I mean, there are lots of other projects. The Chinese were making a big commitment in yep. Tanzania. Yep. How do you see, what does, what does this community look like? Mm. Yeah, well, I think the ports are essential. Yep. And I mean, the reason I didn't talk about the ports is yet because you know our programs are younger there. Mm. But there's been a lot of success. I'm really proud that His Excellency President Kenyatta signed that port charter. I thought that was a really big step in the right direction. Um, and you know, shows his great leadership, really. But there's a kind of software hardware issue with ports you know there's how productive are they and what their capacity is and you know i think what i tried to show today is trade growth is going to be high mm. so you need to invest in increased capacity but you also need to to actually operate it more productively and if you think about it, it's like an equilibrium the more productive you are the less capacity you need the less productive you are the more capacity you need so that equilibrium is, is something that we play with but you know, what's the potential for mombasa is what you asked me I think Mombasa is a very important port. It's the biggest in East Africa. It's double the size of Dar es Salaam. And the hinterland, uh, it, it, Mombasa is truly what we call a corridor port. Because I think around 70% of the cargo, or 80% actually, is actually not for Mombasa. Yes. So while in Dar es Salaam, 80%, 90% is for Dar es Salaam. So it's a very different port. And I think that that's important. The transshipment is, uh, market is, is greater. Most of it does come to Nairobi, though, I think around uh, 60%. And then Kampala is the biggest, and then, and then Kigali is South Sudan. So it's a very different type of port. And because of its, its natural physical location on the, on the northern corridor, which is you know, where a lot of consumers are, it will continue to play that role for a very long time to come. So a very strategic asset for, uh, for Kenya. And getting it right will affect millions of lives. So that's why. We've, we've, we've now got, I think, around an $80 million program there, one of our biggest projects. But Dar es Salaam is also important. I was just in Dar this last week. Again, we're scaling up our program there. Um, and with the World Bank, we're really proud. We're, putting in, we're going to be putting in 60 million. The World Bank will put in 600. That's the kind of leverage ratio that we want, to, we want to get. And on Mombasa, we're actually going to be holding an investors conference for more investment there. So the ports are in critical. I, I, I personally think when you look at trade mm. on the central corridor, which DAR really supports, DAR yes. port, um, there's room for another container, um, another, another port. Mm. And Bagamoyo is yes. where the Chinese, I think you, you hinted yes, at, have right. committed. And they're going to be putting in, I think, about uh, 1.5 billion mm. to develop the site. So because of DAR, it, it's, it's physical. I don't know if you've been there, but the physical uh, dimensions of the port are very constrained. Mm. So you really need to do a lot of efficiency. There's really not much room to increase the capacity. So another port's needed on, on the coast. And Bagamoyo um, is not a bad place because the ancillary infrastructure is pretty good. Um, and then, of course, Matwara is developing quickly as, as a kind of um, gas port. And then there's a potential for Lamu, yes. which uh, I think is early days yet, mm -hmm. but the potential there um, to this link up. Yes. Yep, and also with South Sudan for the oil. I yes. mean, essentially the first project there could easily be an oil pipeline, an offshore, um, offshore uh, platform there. Mm. So, you know, I don't think it's about any one port. Yes. It's about actually making the region, region's trade mm. facilitated by ports, because ports are so important. Mm. And I tried to show today, actually they're the, the biggest source of time and cost delays I, I saw that. along the, the whole corridors. Yeah, yeah. The, co the cost component seemed to be the yeah. biggest issue there. So exactly. So, I, and I think progress is being made. So now you can understand why, why we were so keen uh, to get this port charter here moving, because a lot of it is the moving parts are complex. And operating a good port 
um, really is complicated because there's so many agencies. Uh, someone said to me once, inefficiency at ports is like death by a thousand cuts. Mm. It's little small things that aggregate uh, big time. So getting a kind of agreement amongst the port community is actually a really big step forward. Yes. And, and I remember when we launched it in Mombasa back in June, uh, people came up and said, oh, we never thought this day would happen. So, you know, I think, you know, leadership is really taking this on board. Our, our leaders and our presidents, I think, are really beginning to see that actually this is going to be the stuff that will create the jobs. And, and, and that, that was a big theme of today, I thought, it was that job creation yes, challenge. And, yes. And do, and do you feel confident? I mean, you know, I was thinking everyone talks about it as the demographic dividend, you know, this huge demographic mm. dividend mm. from all these young people. But yeah. the challenge is it could be a demographic time bomb. If well, I think it absolutely. I mean, every 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 uh, coin has another side, mm. and I think it is a dividend, but it's also a huge time bomb. Yeah. And I think if we don't create the jobs, actually, that could be a real challenge. And I think that our, you know our political leaders are seeing that. Yeah. So we really need to invest in ways the private sector can create those jobs. But I, I think what was also interesting was that issue about skills and how yes. and just how long it takes to get a job. Well, I was shocked, and I think everybody was shocked on s yeah. on social media as well. That's yeah. a scary number. It is, and, and I think, you know, I remember the statistic a few years ago. I'm probably out of date, but I think it used to be 800,000 people coming onto the job market Every each year, year yes. with 80,000 jobs in the private sector being created. Now, I mean, that, that really is the challenge that we should be taking very seriously. And, and I've certainly read in, in labor market statistics that it can take between seven and nine years to get that job. So, you know, for, for somebody with a low skills base, that's a big challenge. Yes. So self-employment is the only route for most folks. And actually, you know, that isn't easy. And, uh, you know, the kind of barriers within the financial sector, you know better than me, but if you're an informal uh, business or, yes. or somebody without any collateral, it's not easy no, it to, to really get access to finance. There's more is, product coming up down there, actually, right. it's, it, interestingly yeah, enough, yeah, because people true. see it as an opportunity as well, I think, yeah. post with the mobile phone revolution. That's true. And, and I know that uh, Equity Bank, and lots, there's been a lot more financial right. sector inclusion at that level. But uh, I think that that's going to be the challenge, really. Frank, you know, you, you've been here how many years in East Africa? Eight? Been here eight years now, yeah. yeah. Really enjoyed and it. you were saying there's been quite a transformation. Mm. How would you describe it now? What, what has that transformation been and where is it going directionally? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, confidence. Yes. I mean, I think confidence has changed a lot, hasn't it? And investment. There's a lot more in investment coming into Africa. And how many private equity funds did we have eight years ago? Yes. Almost none. How many yeah. do we have? Yes. Oh, a lot now. Yeah. So I think that, that there's, uh, and you may argue that that's due to quantitative easing if you want to get technical, but you know, that liquidity has found its way to Africa. And I, I, so I think, you know, that investment, the, the, the capital's there. I think there's been a lot of, actually a lot of progress on the regional front. Mm. I mean, you know, I, th I think I said to you, um, thanks to the EAC yes. and some of the work that we're doing and many others, um, you know, times to, to trade from uh, getting a container from Mombasa to Kampala. It's come down from, I think, around 18, 20 days to now six. Yes. Now that's a big transformation. So I see a lot of changes there. The leadership, I think, is much more behind this. People see that infrastructure is a key challenge. In the old days, people used to kind of grin and bear it. Yes. Now people say, and actually, you know, there are plans now on the agenda there. I think the other big thing I see is that the private sector is just really, you know, burgeoned. You know, there's been a lot of growth. And, and it's been in sectors that, you know, a lot of people in Europe don't recognize. Retail, yes. real estate, consumption, telecoms, mm. services. So, you know, that's, that I think has been a, you know, a it really big really change. It has been an extractive one, extractive no. story, which is interesting. Which is interesting, because yeah. that's always the way it's painted, isn't yes. it? Which I think is quite wrong. Um, and then I think physically Nairobi's changed. Mm. I mean, it used to be that um, you would get around very easily. Yes. The economic growth has negative effects in terms of traffic flows have been really slowed down. But then again, now we see all the new highways, yeah. you know? And now, I mean, you know, just think about the physical change to get to Karen from CBD yeah. and, and e even to get um, to, from, to, to Westlands, the other part of the, the city and, and other parts. Uh, we've seen bypasses come in. Physically, that's changed a lot. And every street corner in Nairobi has changed, yes. hasn't it? it and now when I think about where my office is, there are 10 high rises that weren't there no, four, year, four or five years ago. Yeah. So I, th I think on many fronts it's changed. Um, and confidence, I, I feel, is, 
you know, it's something to be proud of, the way that things have moved forward. So I don't know. I, I, I think um, it's really been a bit of a renaissance, really. Now, I mean, the big challenge is can we sustain it? Yes. And I think what are the biggest, what's the biggest risk to all this? Well, I, you know, I, 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 I know it sounds all a bit academic, but I, I think actually the resilience of institutions, and I don't mean the kind of bricks and mortar buildings, you know, a regulator or whatever, but really the rules of the game that markets operate by. Really, how, how resilient are they? And how, how adaptable and how much can they be reformed? I think that's the challenge because we're up against the rest of the world. It's got to be really good. And I think that to me is a, the real that's challenge. You know, we, we need institutions that are not just okay, but are really good. And they continue to adapt and give us the competitiveness we need as a region. Because, you know, without those institutions underpinning it, this could be a growth spurt that could finish. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's probably to me the biggest thing. But then also the political commitment mm. to really seeing some of these things happen. Um, and, you know, I, I think some of the other things that we talked about, you know, the, the infrastructure and so forth. So I think particularly I'm interested to explore that. We'll be thinking that through what we do and yes. we'll try to help the region realize that growth over the next five years. So, you know, I'm really hoping that the, the trademark uh, program and what we're trying to do is, is actually really helps that happen. You know, that's what we really want to do is make it a very practical partner to realize the prosperity through trade. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Okay.